Hey, what's up? This is Isaac. You're listening to the intro to the intro, which means you're on the free feed. Unfortunately, that means you're missing out today. Today we're doing the December bonus episode, and it just so happened to land on this very controversial film, Leave the World Behind on Netflix. I'm going to play a big, healthy chunk of this bonus show for you, but it's a long show. It's it's over an hour and a half if you listen to the full bonus episode, and I'm going to give you dang near half of the thing, okay? And if you like what you're getting into there, then it's time for you to sign up. You can support the show, and you're going to get all of the goods in the world. I've got three supporter options now, okay? I know, I, I know I've been mixing it up, but I'm trying to figure out the one that works the best, okay? So patreon.com slash Illuminati Watcher. That's the that's the gold standard. Everyone goes there. Everyone loves it. It's a great deal. You get a comment section and all that where you can talk to me. I read the comments and all that, okay? Uh, you'll get the downloads of Kubrick's Code and The Dark Path as a Tier 1 member. Uh, I've got annual discounts. And, of course, you'll go ad-free and you'll unlock 170-plus bonus episodes. We're also doing the Twin Peaks Grey Lodge breakdowns every month. Uh, man, we've got the Dark Path Book Club. And the list just goes on and on and on. Patreon.com slash Illuminati Watcher is the first one. That's the most popular. Then I've got the one, the Patreon that I run at IlluminatiWatcher.com. Hit the VIP section tab up top, and you can read all about it. In fact, you can compare the supporter options right there at IlluminatiWatcher.com. I compared what you get and don't get on each one, but that's the one that I run. A tad clunkier because you got to sort of figure out how to get your RSS link that I'll get emailed to you. And you drop it into a compatible player. But, you know, I can help. I'm there to help walk you through that one. I'm the support man. So if you have any issues with that, you're going to see in the receipt an email. Which you, you can hit me up and I'll walk you through whatever you need help with, okay? But it's basically the same. You know, you're going to get the free download books. You're going to go ad free. You're going to get all the same bonus content. In fact, that one, VIP section, goes all the way back to when I started, back to 2014. Whereas Patreon goes back to, I think, like 2017. And you can save a few more bucks on the VIP section. I think the annual discount goes even cheaper there. And then the third one is the easiest option, but it costs the most. That's the Apple Premium. You, If you're using Apple, you you know where to go. You just hit it, hit the subscribe button, you're in. Just that easy. And then you go ad-free, bonus content, and all the great things. But you don't get the books, right? But it's simple. I mean, it's as easy as you could ever ask for. So those are your three options. Like I said, I don't do Rockfin uh, bonus content stuff over there anymore. That's only a free feed option now. My apologies. I know. I know. The Rockfin people, they're so mad at me. I'm very sorry. I know. But unfortunately, and I tried to make this work, folks. Listen, I've been on there for three years. And if you don't think the last two years I haven't been doing it just to sort of, because I know I said, hey, check me out on Rockfin. And now I'm like, oh, I'm not doing it anymore. Like, I get it. It's annoying. And if you're if you're one of those people, um, leave a comment on the Rockfin on a video there. I'll see the comment and I'm gonna hit you with an email, which you can hit me up and I'll uh, I'll see I'll hook you up. All right, okay, um, okay. Now let's get into the preview. Like I said, I'm gonna drop a big fat 45 minute ish preview of the show. It's really good. This is a banger, and everyone's talking about it, but they're missing so many things, and I'm I'm exposing all of them. All right. And you're going to hear what I what I'm going to give you a little preamble of what you're going to expect. So I'm not going to double up on that. But anyway, here's the free preview. If it's your time to support the show, you know where to go. Links are always in the show notes. I'll see you on the other side. And as we're getting off the phone, I asked if he wanted to grab a drink. He tells me he's going away for a while. I joke back to him. Oh, yeah. You hanging with your evil cabal this weekend? Thought that was only during the winter solstice. <laughs> and he doesn't laugh. Welcome back to Occult Symbolism and Pop Culture. I'm your host, Isaac Wiseup. Today we're talking about a Netflix movie called Leave the World Behind. There's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack. And today is a bonus episode. Uh, that's just how the timing worked out. Every month I do an episode... A bonus show only for the supporters. The supporters keep the show alive. And they get bonus content and today. Just so I happen to land on this controversial film. We're going to do a full analysis of this Netflix film. Obama produced. It's called Leave the World Behind. And we're going to go deep into theories of elites controlling the world. Through cosmological rituals 
Evolution of Man through Huxley Agenda 2030 UN-esque type ideas. Some symbolism, of course, as always. Lots of symbolism to unpack. How many all-seeing eyes did you count? I counted many, and we're going to talk about them today. As well as symbolism of Stanley Kubrick. Yes, Stanley Kubrick. The Shining is clearly, clearly symbolized in here, as well as our favorite movie, Eyes Wide Shut. The, the greatest Christmas movie ever recorded. Eyes Wide Shut. Oh, you didn't know you didn't know there was Eyes Wide Shut in here? Well, you better stay strapped in because we're going to cover that. We also have a little bit on Matthew Perry and Friends, right? The show Friends. And, of course, symbolism of alchemy. We talk about deer symbolism because there's deers throughout the movie. It's on the cover of the uh, movie or whatever you call it. The that, What do you call that? You used to call it the cover like when things came in DVD cases or VHS cases. The image of the movie shows you a deer because it's prominently featured in the film and uh we're going to talk about it because guess what it's about it's about sacrificing humans my god i'm going to talk about the illuminati uh the illuminati white man's burden of controlling humanity so these these psychopaths out there this is how they think we're going to talk about that too there was a ton of chatter about this online and I, um, it was funny because I actually, I think I saw it on Letterboxd, this movie was trending, getting good reviews, and I thought, oh, okay. And I just so happened to have some free time on Sunday. And I queued it up, and it pulled me right in. Very suspenseful. And I noticed everyone's talking about it now. All the conspiracy theorists are talking about it. Luckily, I already had, I was 30 minutes in. I thought, man, there's a lot going on here. Once I saw the Obama thing in the credits, I thought, oh, boy, here we go. And there was an all-seeing eye right off the bat. I said, oh, boy. So I, I finished it. Then I hurried up and rewatched it again and took my notes. And here we are today. But, uh, yeah, I you know, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of conspiracy. I've, I've read some. Things people didn't like it. I thought it was a great movie. Now, I'm not blinded with Obama rage that a lot of people probably are. <laughs> people are mad. They're like, I'm not watching nothing with Obama's name on it. Well, I don't know what to tell you. Is it worth watching? I thought so. I enjoyed it. Even with the long runtime, 141 minutes, that's almost two and a half hours. Good God. That's a long ass movie. But to its um I don't know. I lost my phrase there. <laughs> to uh, speak to how suspenseful it was, it didn't. It flew by pretty quick. But yes, if you want to know, should you watch it before you listen to this? Yes, you should. If you like suspenseful movies, it was very Hitchcockian. I thought. I thought it was really good. So yes, I would prefer you watch it before I ruin the whole story. Because once I give you all the info on the I'm spoiled the plot. It's not going to be quite as suspenseful. Let's briefly go uh, into the film. It was filmed in April 22. Released in limited theaters November 22nd of 23. Curious date. Curious date, my friends. November 22nd, 1963, of course, is when they blasted JFK in that ritual. The James Shelby Downard King Kill 33 ritual. Live on television. The revolution will be televised, they told us. And then things never got on track since then. It's been deception upon deception. The film is based upon a book of the same name by a guy, I don't know if it's a guy, by a person named Rahman Alam. And then we've got the cast. All-star cast. Julia Roberts plays... The uh, the the one mom, the mom, the wife, I don't know, the one woman, <laughs> Amanda Sanford, played by Julia Roberts. Then her husband, Clay Sanford, is Ethan Hawke, and they have two little kids. Then you've got, I'm going to butcher these names, Mayor Shala Ali as G.H. Scott, a.k.a. George Scott, and he's with his daughter, Ruth Scott, played by Mayala, Mayala. Sorry for butchering the names. 
it was directed by a guy named Sam Esmail, who apparently was the director of Mr. Robot. I've never seen it. It's apparently about hackers and stuff, which is apropos for what this movie's going to get into. Uh, and with that said, plot spoilers coming. We're going to get into the movie right now. I'm going to break you, run through the whole plot with you. Break down a lot of conspiracy symbolism as we go. And it's going to be it's going to be a wild ride, folks. Also another warning, I'm swearing today. I'm swearing. We usually don't do that on this show cuz I know some people don't like the swearing and I can respect that. But today's not your day. Cuz the film's got swearing and I'll be playing the clips from it. Therefore, they are dropping the F bombs, I will also. I will take advantage of that and allow myself to <laughs> speak freely. I cuss like a sailor in my real life, folks. And today we're going to mix it up a little bit, so get ready for that. All right, you ready? Let's go. Film starts out with the sun tracking over the earth. It's a new day, right? And you're going to see these cosmological activities and, and astrological bodies throughout the film. And my belief is that they're pointing to the idea of humanity evolving in cycles based upon the patterns of astrology. Some of the great reset folks subscribe to this idea. A variety of sources we've gone through over the years. We did how many episodes on the great reset? Did we do six, seven? Well, I did a book review, uh, the great reset part five. I read a book called generations from 1991 and wouldn't you know it, it predicted the future about QAnon and what the occultist uh, fourth turning, basically the new age of man. You know, this is a theme you see all the time. Age of Aquarius and the New Age and all this stuff. And the Kali Yuga. We, we did a whole show about Steve Bannon. We interviewed Professor Ben Teitelbaum about his book, War for Eternity, about Steve Bannon's traditionalism. And they want to take advantage of the shifting cycles of humanity. And they want to instill a traditional-esque, authoritarian dictator fascist sort of figure so we've got these forces fighting for what the future looks like and if you ask me it's very critical to the discussion i'm going to put links in the show notes to those two episodes if you haven't heard them before because they go back to 2020 maybe you're new you should check those out if you want to be very uh i don't know scared is the right word <laughs> if you want to be very enlightened into what is possibly happening here behind the scenes the we're talking about the planned or should i say facilitated collapse of society is what this is all about it's about the illuminati the elites trying to coordinate a collapse of society so they can rebuild it in their vision of total control these various forces they are waiting waiting their turn to instill their globalist new world order their Luciferian world order. Some people, the because there's, I think there's forces fighting against each other. You've got this sort of Luciferian forces waiting. Then you've got the white Christian nationalist forces waiting. Like everyone's waiting to sort of for this cycle to kick over so they can, you know, rebuild. Which is a uh, you know it's it's to tear down and rebuild. It is a a, a concept called solve and coagula. You see it on the Baphomet. We've seen it many times. 9-11, a big ritual, you could argue, that was doing the same thing. Anyways, back to the movie. We see, we're introduced to Amanda and Clay. That's Julia Roberts and Ethan Hawke. Husband and wife, they're in their bedroom. It's entirely blue. It's way too blue. I don't know what that's about. Maybe they're setting the mood. She seems a little depressed, maybe. And if you look closely, you're going to see Clay's got a mug that says 76ers, even though they live in New York, but the Philadelphia 76ers. And you'll also see on the fireplace mantle, there is an eagle, like a stuffed eagle. And I noticed this and thought, that's kind of strange. It was the Sixers mug that kind of made me think, well, that's kind of weird. They live in New York, but it's a Philly mug, right? Well, it made me think of The Shining. Do you remember in The Shining, the symbolism of America... The guy who Jack Nicholson at the beginning, he goes to get interviewed for the position at the Overlook. 
And the guy interviewing him, I can't think of his name right now. In fact, I got a handy dandy copy of my book, Kubrick's Code Handy, right here. And uh, I'm going to look it up live on the air. We're going to look it up. Because uh, someone bought this and I'm going to ship it out to him, okay? Stuart Allman. Is that the character's name or is that the actor? Anyway, Stuart Allman looks a lot like JFK. And you can see, that's the character's name, Stuart Allman. You can see on his desk a lot of paraphernalia, flags and eagles and stuff. This is in my book, Kubrick's Code, if you're watching the video version of the podcast. But, and then even when they pack up and leave for the winter, he still has these American uh, sort of flags and stuff around the office. The, and the point, and we're also going to see some more symbolism from The Shining at the end of the film. Bookmarking it nicely. We'll come back to that. But anyways, just take note to that, right? And um, Amanda, she's like, hey, Clay, I, uh, I'm packing bags. I booked, I booked an Airbnb getaway for, for the family, for the weekend. We're going to get out of here. All right. And then they roll the credits. And on the credits, you will notice an all-seeing eye. And I'm going to put images of all these things I'm talking about on my Instagram, at Isaac Whiteside. It's going to be two posts because it's like 20 images. A lot of images here to unpack. So look for both posts on there, at Isaac Weisop. Links are always in the show notes. They roll the credits. We see the Obamas listed as executive producers. Ain't that something? Well, they own a production company called Higher Ground Productions. Apparently, they had signed a deal with Spotify and then Audible. This is their fourth film. They did some TV shows. If you saw on Netflix, Adam Conover's show, The G Word, talks about the government processes. I thought it was pretty good. It was entertaining. Um, and then there's a show called Working What We Do All Day. I have not seen that yet. And lo and behold, they're working on a film about the the uh, the Betty and Barney Hill alien abduction called White Mountains. Now, you know we're skeptical of all the things we're being told about the UFO agenda. Well, isn't that interesting? Isn't that something? And you could argue, you know, I don't have a whole expose about Obama. I know some people don't like him. I know some people think there's a conspiracy that Michelle is a man. They call call her Michael Obama. Whatever, right? I mean, that's people want to believe all this stuff. But it is interesting because here you've got a guy who had access to all the secrets pretty much. Well, actually, if you believe some of the other... It seems that based upon the testimony of like David Grush and these UFO whistleblowers that there is an inner sanctum. Even the president doesn't have access to all the info, which is pretty wild. But he's definitely got access to some ideas. So it definitely stands out as something worth noting about this movie. Because once we get through the movie, you're going to say, is that going to happen here in America? And lo and behold... Since I, since I made this, uh, started working on this film analysis, I just retweeted it. There is, uh, disclo- excuse me, disclosed.tv posted a Fox News clip of the Chinese cyber army invading critical U.S. services, including the power grid, ports, pipelines, and water utilities. Listen up, we've seen so many people making ridiculous money from crypto, but did you know it's easy for you to do the same? If you followed my show, you know that we've talked about the cryptocurrencies going all the way back to 2017. Very fascinating subject. But there's a way you can get into all this with the easiest way possible. It's the Copy My Crypto membership site that shows you the coins that YouTuber James McMahon personally holds and allows you to copy him. It's like having a big brother who knows what he's doing. You don't need to know a thing about crypto or how to invest as you simply do what he does i'm also a member of this and i've combed through some of the videos he's got some how-to videos showing you where to get the coins how to make it happen it's all there for you so let me tell you about james he runs the crypto with james youtube channel which despite heavy censorship we all know youtube loves the censorship it's hit twenty-six thousand subscribers which is a big to do right 
since March 2020, he told his viewers to buy 26 crypto coins. And had you put 100 bucks into each one, it went on to become worth more than $123,000. So of the 26 coins, his top pick of the year, a coin called Phantom, went up 692x from when he said. That one call has retired a number of people, including guys in their 20s and 30s. But remember, this is all public knowledge. You can go to YouTube and verify this for yourself. So if you'd like to join the 2,800 members and your boy Isaac, who copied James, then stop what you're doing. Head over to copymycrypto.com slash Isaac. That's copymycrypto.com forward slash Isaac, I-S-A-A-C, right? Two A's for double awesome. A lot of people misspell that. They throw two S's in there. No, it's two A's for double awesome. You got it. So copymycrypto.com forward slash Isaac. You'll not only find proof of everything I've said, but my listeners get full access for just one dollar. Once again, it's copymycrypto.com forward slash Isaac. Link in the show notes as always. Anyway, so when you, this gets more into the geopolitical realm, not really my steez, so I'm not going to get too deep into it. But the point to take away, the Obamas had a hand in this movie and the Obamas they're very, uh, you know, educated folks. They've been around a place or two. It makes you wonder if this isn't real. Okay, so the family, they're in their car, and they're headed out to this Airbnb, and we hear that the rental listing says, leave the world behind. That's where the title comes from. Apparently, the son and daughter, what's their name, Archie and Rose, they're in the back seat. And again, look at the image on the Instagram. The boy is wearing a um shorts that are black and white checkered shorts and this is symbolic of freemasonry with the black and white checkered tessellating floors and the in the lodges right the moses pavements and the girl is watching friends on her ipad that's right friends isn't that something and later you find out in the epi- in the movie that the episode she's watching is the final episode the series finale now what are the odds here Matthew Perry just died mysteriously under that full moon, the Hunter Moon. And remember his tweet, because we did two shows on Matthew Perry. Check those out. Recall his tweet October 22nd. He said, perfect movies, Back to the Future, Midnight Run, and then it was, then it had a blank line. Now, po- probably he was talking about the Batman movies because he was, incessantly talking about Batman for a week before he died. But what if he was referencing this movie? I'm just going to throw that out there. I don't I don't have any reason to believe that. Was there a connection there? I don't know. So the family, they take exit number 76. There's another 76. Another 76. You know, of course the 76 references the Declaration of Independence of America from Britain. And we're talking about a revolution here. That's what we're talking about. And it cues up uh, Cool and the Gang. They're, they're arguably their best song, Misled. And, and it's funny because I actually, I wish I could remember who was the one I was having a conversation with on the, on the DMs somewhere that someone said, hey, you should watch the video for Misled. And I love the song. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I'll check it out. And if you watch the video, you're not going to believe what's in it. The The lead singer, he's chasing this woman who's a ghost. But the band, they're secretly, they're masked up in cloaks and eyes wide shut masks. And this this is a video from what? Like the late 70s, early 80s? So there's a nod to Eyes Wide Shut, another Kubrick film. And there's going to be more. This Whoever directed this movie was certainly into Kubrick. And who can blame him? All right, now we start part one. Or was it part two? Part one? I think I might have my parts wrong here, so don't don't quote me on these. I'm just going to say what I got in my notes and hope I'm right. (laughs) Part one, the house. Because it's broken up into, I think, four or five parts. And I'm going to play the clip for you here so you can hear it with your own ears. Listen to what the Wi-Fi password is. The Wi-Fi password is a novella. The owner must be one of those cybersecurity guys. 
I don't know if you caught that. Amanda shows she's in the house. She says the Wi-Fi password is Novella. What's that make you think of? It makes you think of Dream Novella. That is the Arthur Schnitzler novel that Kubrick was obsessed with. The whole basis for his film Eyes Wide Shut. To me, that's clearly an indicator. All right. Illumina confirm. Stamp it. So Amanda, she goes to the grocery store and she looks over. She sees Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon's there. And he's loading up on water and supplies. And they kind of exchange a look and, she, you know, whatever, right? Foreshadowing. Then Amanda and Clay and the family, the kids, they all go to Charleston Harbor to the beach. And Archie's, like, girlfriend, Taylor, she drops a pin and he shows the phone to the mom and is like, hey, can we check out, can we go get Taylor? And and she's like, no, she's in Sag Harbor. That's an hour away. And the image you see on the phone, if you look it up on Google Maps, because I would thought, man, the, when the movie's over, you're like, what did that have to do with anything? What did the Sag Harbor and the girlfriend Taylor have to do with anything? It had nothing to do with anything, as far as I could tell. So I thought, maybe that was a clue. So I looked it up on Google Maps. It doesn't look like the same spot. The pin that she provided doesn't quite look the same. It does show uh, North Haven, but the bodies of water between North Haven and Sag Harbor are not, they don't look the same. I, I don't know what to make of that. It was weird. Um, the only time it comes up again is later towards the end of the movie. There's a part where Archie's like, I wonder if Taylor's okay. And Clay, the dad, looks at him and is like, what are you talking about? And that's it. That's as close as you get to it. Now, fun fact, Sag Harbor is where Jimmy Buffett died. Fun fact, Jimmy Buffett was born on Christmas. <laughs> okay, so the family, they're on the beach. Here comes a massive oil tanker headed towards them. Everyone's just staring at it, assuming it's going to stop. But of course it does not. And it crashes onto the beach. Very chaotic. Now, this boat, if you look, it's called the White Lion. And that I'm going to guess that is probably a reference to the first slave ship called the White Lion that brought Africans to Virginia in 1619. Because later on in the movie, Clay is in his car and, the, and he sort of stops the radio on channel 1619. But the White Lion is symbolic. It is symbolic in terms of occult symbolism. So let's take a look. Uh, astrology and alchemy. The, the lion's gate, all right? And the the power of lion's gate lies in the cosmic synergy between the stars, signs, and numbers, and it's the annual alignment between the sun and Leo and Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, known as Alpha Canis Majoris or the dog star. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's because I read that exact description on our episode about the Maui fires. That's right, because those started... On the first day of the Lion's Gate opening up. Isn't that something? And, of course, the Lion's Gate is activated with uh, the rising of the star Sirius, which is a binary star, but whatever. And it's the most occult thing that can happen, all right? It means that which is hidden is revealed because Crowley and Grant, they called the the serious star, the hidden sun, the sun behind the sun. The Freemasons call it the blazing star. It's also in every lodge. And recall that the boy Archie is wearing the black and white shorts. Um, seems odd. And now in alchemy, they use the symbolism of the lion as well. You typically see it in red or green because in alchemy, it represents the stages of human evolution in the form of different animals like birds or lions. And Jung said that the lion is, it represents primitive and turbulent psychological states in the human life cycle. Well, what do you think is about to happen in this movie? Primitive and turbulent psychological states with the breakdown of society. And if it's a white lion, then it would be the second stage of alchemy, the albedo post negredo after surrendering to the darkness of negredo it will release all this heavy um you know baggage 
and you'll have this new form of fresh energy to convert to grow into the next stages, you know, because it goes black, white, yellow, red. Red being the phoenix, the the rebirth, which I think is what we're, I think that's what this movie's trying to show us, right? So they leave, they leave the beach after seeing this oil tanker breach, and they make a whole scene about stopping at Starbucks, of all places. Isn't that something? We just did two full episodes about the symbolism of Starbucks being the Abraxas, chicken-headed snake god, witchcraft, Melusina, the Faustian bargains of selling one's soul to the devil, all tied to the symbol. And they make, a, again, a sort of non-relevant scene in the movie of stopping to get this coffee at the Starbucks. Then we go back to the house rental, and we're all back in the house. Amanda, she sees some deer in the backyard, and Clay says, oh, deer, those are good. that's a good omen in Mesoamerican mythology. You sure about that? Are you sure about that, buddy? We looked it up. Let's see what we found. Deers are considered sacred animals, messengers, or shamans. They represent the personification of virtue. But I looked specifically for this Mesoamerican symbolism. Boy, have I got some bad news. I'm going to reference you to Matthew Looper's book, The Beast Between, Deer in Maya Art and Culture. And the short version of what I'm about to read you is that deer are used as sacrifices to the gods. They were a parallel to human sacrifice because they used to do that down in Mesoamerica. And it gets into the, um, not in this reading, but it gets into the idea that antlers are a mystical, magical thing and it points towards the heavens. And that's why the deer are considered divine messenger creatures from the gods. I'm going to read you some notes from this book. Matthew Looper's book. I didn't read the book. I'm re- this is a synopsis, just to be clear. Chapter 3, Big Bucks, and Chapter 5, Locking Horns, Respect- respectively consider the imagery of the deer hunt in the context of elite social and political status and with respect to sacrifice imagery. Chapter 3 shows that deer bodies provided objects for tax, tribute, and trade. The deer also acted as a symbol for larger ideas about prey versus predator, which theme in the movie. Finally, at the ruling level, dining on deer meat enabled competitive feasting and may have indicated control over the areas it roamed or the networks necessary for its procurement, even as the hunt itself acted as a metaphor for elite male heroism. Chapter 5 explores animal hierarchies displayed during various activities as demonstrated Blah, 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 blah. As these chapters demonstrate, the deer can be connected with first-level elites by marking control of important resources, liminal areas, or youthful coming-of-age rituals. It can also be associated with the junior elite body as a provider or of tribute or taxation and, as, and or as inferior to the jaguar symbolism of supreme rulers. Alternatively, in a truly polysemous Polysimus manner, the liminal deer can be equated with sacrificial victims who exist in a transitional moment between life and death as the prey of more powerful political leaders. In a further interchange of conceptual categories, first-tier elites could take the place of the deer sacrificial victim in expressing ritual power at liminal moments. Sacrifice for the elites. Boom. And it's all throughout the movie. That's what the symbolism of the deer is. Kind of scary. It's kind of scary it's being thrown out there. And I'm like, Obama, what are we doing, bro? What are we doing, man? Why why are you are they warning us? And there's a reason why later you could argue that it's a warning. <laughs> hide your wife, hide your kids. All right. And, and and if I forget, the what I'm talking about is there's a parable provided by the daughter, Ruth, that could be a stark warning that we need to listen up and pay attention. Yeah, take that for what it's worth. All right. 
So we see the sun moving around the globe yet again, again with its cosmological bodies affecting us down on Earth, as above, so below, micro and macro. Follow along. Come on, folks. Get with me. Hermetic axiom here. Now it's late, and Amanda and Clay, they're drinking wine, having a good time, right? And this whole time, like, the internet's not working, right? They're like, oh, the TV's not working, the internet's not working, whatever, right? And Clay is talking about how one of his students, Maria Miller, was b- talking about how he's such an inspiration for her writing and how he's going to write the foreword to her book because he's a college professor. But what I'm thinking is, like, is he banging one of his students? Doesn't come up again. But I, I wonder if, I bet in the book it does. I bet in the book it, there's details of that. Some smutty little details. Meanwhile, there's a knock on the door. And they open the door, and it's a, a black man and his daughter. And they're dressed real nice. He's wearing suit and tie. She's in a dress. Turns out they came from a symphony, okay? And they tell Amanda and Clay, they're like, hey, this is kind of weird. We're the owners of the home. I know like this is unexpected, but here's what happened. We were at the symphony, and we went to our home in New York or wherever, and the power went out in the city, so we decided it's probably easier just for us to stay in, in our home, which is this home that we rented out to you. And I want you to look at my Instagram, at, at Isaac Weishaupt. You'll notice there's artwork behind the front, right by the front door when they, let, when, uh, they open the door. It's a painting of all-seeing eyes, just a bunch of all-seeing eyes. Where are we at now? Is that two, two references of the symbolism of the all-seeing eye, right? The enlightenment, the awakening of the occult agenda. But now Amanda, she she don't trust these two at all. Clay, he's kind of chill about it. They end up reluctantly agreeing and they say, look, uh, you know, you know, uh, George, he says, look, I'm going to give you half of your money back for this inconvenience. Here's a thousand bucks. And we'll stay downstairs. And George, he's acting a bit funny, though. He's acting kind of funny. He tries to unlock the liquor cabinet with these keys because he's got some cash in there, but he can't find the key, and he's just like, oh, huh. well, I forgot which key it is. And inside the drawer, he opens it up with the envelope of cash. There's a pistole right there. The suspension is building because you're wondering, is there really a blackout? Who are these people? Do they really own the home? So Clay, uh, some other symbolism to consider. He's wearing a shirt that says Bikini Kills. This is a feminist punk band. Uh, fun fact, the lead singer Kathleen Hanna is married to Adam Horowitz from the Beastie Boys. One of my favorites. In fact, I was just listening to License to Ill the other day. That's a timeless album. That's one of the greatest albums ever released by anyone, ever. Prove me wrong. And Kathleen Hanna, she also uh, has a place in history because she wrote on Kurt Cobain's wall before he was famous. She wrote, Kurt smells like teen spirit. Because back in the day, here's the thing, young folks, there was deodorant called Teen Spirit. And she wrote, Kurt smells like Teen Spirit, and the rest is history, right? He uses that as the title of their breakout single. Okay, back to the movie. We hear that George, uh, who's, you know, it's just George and his daughter, Ruth, and they're like, well, where's your where's your wife? And George says, well, my wife was on a work trip to Morocco. We have lost contact with her because of a blackout. And we hear that she's an art dealer. Now, what what else, does that remind you of? It reminds you of Eyes Wide Shut. Because remember, Alice was an art dealer. Nicole Kidman's character. Amanda asked for identification. What do you know? George left his wallet behind. This guy is acting mad sus right now. Right? What's he doing? Meanwhile, emergency broadcast warning plays on TV. And Ruth, that's George's daughter, right? She implies that this emergency isn't just, it's not just a blackout. She thinks it's terrorism or power plants or something bad's going on. And now there's a bit of beef between Ruth and Amanda. Amanda just hates Ruth right off the bat. Because that's another, we don't, I'm not going to go into this in the analysis, but in the movie, there's this tension between primarily through between Amanda and George and his daughter, Ruth. And I think the implication is that it's a racial issue, right? They don't specifically come out right and say it, but that's kind of what it seems like. 
There's a lot of racial undertones in the film, you know? Like as, like in George's home in the basement, or in the, yeah, in the basement, they've got, you know, lots of like, uh, I don't know, historical black artwork and stuff like that. You know, it's an element, right? It's not harped upon, really, but it's there. And I think it's because there's this element of stoking a civil war. And if you followed my blog, you'll know that around 2012 to 2015, I was pointing out a lot of symbolism of what seemed like provocation of a race war, like uh, Helter Skelter-esque. Lots of weird Manson symbolism showing up, like the, the term Rise was on a lot of stuff, and Rise was supposed to be a trigger. Charles Manson wrote it in blood as a way to trigger uh, the the civil the uh, the race war. You know, there was a lot of weird stuff going on, and you know, I don't know if it went away necessarily, but it's an element in the show for in the movie for sure. So let's see what else we got. Oh yeah, and then another element is when George and Ruth go downstairs. Like I talked about, there's various you know sort of like black empowerment art, I guess. I don't know. And there's a, a piece of art on the wall, and it's United States of America, and it's in the crosshairs of red and green, a giant crosshair. And that is actually a poster called the United States of Attica. Um, it says here, I looked it up because I thought, man, that's a, that's a strange American map, green and red. And I looked it up. Sure enough, you can uh, actually what I did was I screenshot it, and I zoomed in. And I read some of the wording about, it said something about violence in America. I thought, well, that's kind of weird. What is this? And I found it. It says, the poster, the United States of Attica, was the most widely distributed of Faith Ringgold's posters during the 70s. It's dedicated to the men who died in 71 at Attica Prison for demonstrating against the deplorable conditions they faced as inmates. The red, black, and green poster depicts a map of the United States, noting indigenous, slave, and immigrant uprisings and the dates and other details of acts of violence that occurred within each state since the 1700s. Racist violence, witch hunts, assassinations, lynchings, and other oppressive actions against the indigenous and people of color in the United States. It also includes military imperialist violence committed by the United States abroad. So on and so forth. Um, A laconic invitation to add further... Okay. Yeah, at the bottom it says you can add more... Um, things here it says a laconic invitation to add further acts of violence emphasizes historical continuity and the ceaselessness of violence as a defining characteristic of the development of the United States of America. Now, um, of course, there's like this race thing going on, you know, but ultimately the movie is about just civil war, civil unrest, regardless of skin color. And that's a theme throughout the film. But Amanda, she's still fuming. She's upstairs fuming. And she's kind of tripping. She says, look, there's not one photo of this family in this home. And she thinks Ruth is snarky. Clay's like, no, they're cool. Chill out. Whatever. And the camera shot, it kind of goes between upstairs and downstairs. It reminds me, again, another as above, so below element kind of thing. And on the TV, for a split second... You see, it says CNN shows the cyber attack on America in the middle of the emergency broadcast system, but it goes out right away. So you can see that people are attempting to send messages out that the country is under attack. Then we start part two, the curve. And immediately I thought, oh, the the earth's not flat. The earth's not flat. That's what we're going to find out. But no, that's not it. Again, we see the earth with a satellite. Ruth, she's, she's, um, no, Rose, I got my notes wrong here, Rose is, she's bugging her mom, Amanda, but how she just wants to finish Friends, this, she's on the series finale, and her, her iPad glitched out, but there's no internet, right, then Amanda, she sees some news flashes on her phone about cyber attacks and hackers, and it disappears as quick as she sees it, she starts bitching at Clay, Clay's like, all right, I'm going to get up, get out of bed. I'm going to drive into town, and we're going to figure out what's going on. Ruth sees, um, I got the notes wrong, Ruth, uh, Rose. Rose sees a bunch of deer in the yard. She's kind of tripping out on it. There's a bunch of them, like 
I don't know, dozens of deer. Then uh, we see, you know, George. He's uh, George is strapped, man. He's got he's got his pistole. Ruth, she's got a vape. She's gonna smoke, and uh, she's in her bikini. She goes out by the pool where everyone's at. Archie, the boy, he starts sneaking in some photos. Uh, meanwhile, Clay, he's driving into the town. He gets lost and he's frantic. And a woman who's screaming Spanish at him is asking for help, but he just is trembling. He's scared, so he leaves her. And a drone plane starts dropping all these pamphlets. And George, he he goes over to the neighbor's house, which we find out the name of the neighbor's house is the Huxleys. It appears to be sort of looted or empty. And he goes in there and he grabs a satellite phone, but it's not working. Okay. Now, Huxley, let's not gloss over this. Of course, it's a reference to the Huxley family, right? Aldous Huxley, who wrote the uh, the Brave New World novel. And we just talked about the Huxleys. I did a show about Jamie Foxx's, Netflix's show, uh, They Clone Tyrone. Remember that? And in the in that, you'll notice, again, symbolism, they have drinks called Soma. If You, you got to look for it, though. In They Clone Tyrone, there's a drink called Soma, and that was a drug in Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. And Aldous Huxley, he wrote The Doors of Perception, which uh, the cover of it has an all-seeing eye, by the way. Three of them, I believe. And The Doors of Perception obviously influenced a new uh, age of thinking with Tim Leary and ascending to higher consciousness. And, of course, Jim Morrison and The Doors got their name from this book. And Jim Morrison's dad was naval intelligence or whatever, right? Or the commander of the ship in the Gulf of Tonkin. The false flag that got us into the Vietnam War. You know, that, and that's one of the things, man, while I'm thinking about this. These movies, they show us how dangerous humans are. And I actually agree with that. Like, I feel like that's a consideration. I don't think it's as bad as they want us to believe, though. I think we, if, I think if something terrible like that happened and then we had this massive cyber attack blackout, I think people would try to look out for each other. I think they, I think they would. Of course, you're going to have some people that are crazy. Of course. But I think... The movies like this are trying to scare you and say, oh, my God, you need big you need big brother to take control and, and protect you. You know. And that's my whole beef with the uh, traditionalist philosophy of Steve Bannon and Donald Trump, that we need this dictator to come, you know, come keep you in line and make sure you're safe. And like, it's all bull, bull crap, dude. No bullshit. That's right. We're swearing today. I forgot. <laughs> it's all bullshit because. um. No, it's you guys. You guys are the crooks, right? You guys are the crooks that got us into the Gulf, into the uh, Vietnam War. That wasn't that. What didn't even happen? The Vietnamese didn't shoot nothing at our ship. But that's not to say there's not bad people in the world that need taken out, right? So, anyways, Aldous Huxley practiced ritual magic. He was friends with Aleister Crowley, and um... all right, there you go. There's the free preview now. If you want to hear more, if you want to hear where the story goes, because that's actually what really matters here, we're going to talk about symbolism you find on the kids' T-shirts. We're going to meet uh, Kevin Bacon, right? We're going to meet Kevin Bacon, and uh, we're going to hear some of his theories about stuff. Um, well, I think we are, might have already met him if I'm looking at the notes right. It doesn't matter. <laughs> we're going to hear some interesting stories about an evil cabal and them meeting up annually on the winter solstice. That's right. That's where the story goes. Um, we're going to see the Harper Crates Vow of Silence. We're going to um, hear about the parable of the drowning man and how it was a warning. The film was a warning to us, right? The Obamas or the ex- executive producers, they know what's up. They're giving us a warning. We are the drowning man in this parable. And we'll explain that. We're going to see some massive alchemical occult symbolism from the moon in this film and we're gonna talk about why that happens um but yeah like i said we're gonna we're gonna see the final showdown with kevin bacon he is the tarot hermit and he's the conspiracy theorist and he's dropping knowledge and he's the only one prepared for this he's the only one prepared and guess what gets you prepared knowledge being armed with the knowledge of the symbolism 
of what could happen. What could happen in the end days? Spiritually, what's going on? There could be a whole lot going on. And that's, uh, you know, that's one of the services I provide over here. I'm trying to be an interpreter for the symbolism that we're seeing in what could be the end days. My God. So you know where to go. You know the option. You got the three options. Patreon.com slash Illuminati Watcher. That's the most popular. Then you got the Illuminati Watcher.com VIP section. That could be your cheapest one with the annual discount. I max those things out on Patreon and VIP section. But VIP section saves you a little bit more money. And it goes all the way back to 2014. And that's, the, that's my baby. And then um, that's that's maybe if you don't like the community aspect that Patreon gives you. Like some people just hate Patreon. And I'm like, okay, well, here's my version. So, um, And then uh, the third option is your easiest one. If you're on Apple, hit the Apple Premium, hit the subscribe button, and you're in. Just like that. And again, another reminder, I'm not doing the premium content on Rockfin anymore. Okay? Like I said, drop a comment if you got beef on that and I'm and on the Rockfin app on the video and i will send you a message with an email you can contact me and we can work it out all right okay um thanks for your support even if you're staying on the free feed you know i'm not gonna call you a free feed loser anymore but you're a free feed lover now okay (laughs) that's what we do on breaking social norms i'm gonna change that because i know some people get their feelers here i'm just joking i'm joking i'm joking when i call you a free feed loser but you know how it feels. You're losing out. You're losing out every month when we do the bonus content. What are you doing? Uh, but yeah, I get it. Sometimes it's not for people, and that's totally fine. So I hope you uh, stick around the free feed. I've got a banger of a show coming out here soon on Roseanne Bar. I've got one on Miley Cyrus. So stay subscribed to the show and stay woke. <laughs>